my name is Sophia, as I said. Uh, I'm working with South Africa at Act Church of Sweden. We are going to talk about how to take care of the earth, how faith and equality can contribute to climate justice. And with me, I have Francesca de Gasparis from SAFSE, the Southern Africa Faith Community Environmental Institute based in South Africa, Cape Town. And Reverend James Bagwana, you're the Secretary General of the Pacific Conference of Churches. Warm welcome to you. Climate emergency affects every aspect of human lives. It's a matter of morality and accountability. Coming from the church and the churches and the faith community, we know that we are part of the problem, but also part of the solution. Francesca, you call yourself sometimes I know, a feminist climate justice activist. Why? Thank you, Sophia, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, I call myself a feminist climate justice activist, an eco-feminist. Um, we know that climate change disproportionately impacts the globe geographically, but it also disproportionately impacts men and women. It disproportionately impacts women and children. And uh, I already use a feminist lens in my understanding of the world. So we can't remove that issue when we look at climate justice. Climate justice is gender justice. There's no way, if we're serious about justice, that we can ignore that uh, issue of human rights. Yeah. And, and, and Reverend James, you. You are working in a very affected area as a church and faith-based communities. How, how are you working with women and girls affected by the climate, in the climate crisis? Thank you. Um, warm uh, Bula Vinaka, as we say from the Pacific in Fiji. Bula means uh, life and Vinaka means abundance. So we greet each other by saying, may you have life in abundance. How do you have life in abundance in the context of climate change? Um, women and children, obviously, as you said, are uh, disproportionately disadvantaged as a result of climate change, especially in developing countries where you have a lot of subsistence economies and um, there are different roles allocated to different members of the community. Uh, one of the things we do at PCC, of course, is that we have a uh, intersectional approach to climate change and gender justice. So we have specific gender justice programs that we are working on, on the issues of gender-based violence, gender equality, but we're also doing exactly what Francesca is doing, is bringing a feminist lens into our work on climate justice. And so um, particularly for us, we have uh, very strong relationships and partnerships with feminist organizations that are supporting our work. And this is where we see the relationship between church or faith communities and wider civil society that we've got to work together. We have that sense of community in the Pacific, but it, it really comes um, very much front and center for us because often it is women who are responsible for um, fishing in the community, particularly by the coast. The men may go out in the boats, but uh, in most island communities, the men will work in the plantations, and it is the women who have to go and um, find the food from the coast. Now, once people are starting to be relocated, uh, they are moving further and further away from their fishing grounds. So they become security issues. Um, uh, relocation results in a lot of um, uh, psychosocial trauma, which then gets displayed in or manifested through gender-based violence. And so. We have to recognize that um, you know, it's not just, just rising sea levels. It's not just extreme weather. It is um, a very challenging impact when it comes to gender-based violence in, in all its forms. Thank you. And, and, and Francesca, uh, at SAFSE, you, you have a model and a strategy how, how to work with faith communities and faith leaders. How do you bring in the uh, feminist 
part in that very patriarchal society. Thanks, Sophia. Yeah, I, you know, I was talking to James just before now and listening to him now. There's so many parallels between what's going on in sub-Saharan Africa and in the Pacific. Very similar issues. Women play very similar roles. And I think that's really important to acknowledge this role of women in rural communities, in subsistence. What does it mean if there's no water and no food nearby and how deeply that impacts? And then, of course, the lack of leadership roles that women often formally have in the church structures. And I mentioned earlier, some of you might have been here for the panel earlier, that one of the ways that we work with women is to have a clear target of women representation in our meetings, in our spaces, um, and thinking about, so how do we listen to women? How do we engage? Um, and that's around, we really try and get a 50% 50, 50 um, target, which helps us to, and to be honest, it's quite difficult to achieve. Um, there aren't a lot of women still formally in church structures in Africa. Some, some are better than others. Um, so oftentimes we're looking at people who have an informal leadership role. Um, what is it, how do we understand the issues? So who's then speaking, who's then sharing knowledge? How do we understand this intersectional approach is incredibly important with our analysis. And really moving away from feeling that talking about gender issues is something just for women. That uh, oftentimes in my organization, the men say, no, we need to do more on this. So it's not that um, just because I'm a woman, now I'm the one who's speaking out on the issue. So these are some of the ways that we try and address the issue. Yeah. I absolutely agree. I think what you shared on recognizing the different levels of leadership is very important. Um, and that's something that it's important to do, not just to look at leadership at a national church or faith level or regional level, but actually going down to the community level. Because um, when you break it down, you have women, women's groups within the church, and they have leaders who then advocate on behalf of the women in the community. And so what we try and do when we go and visit uh, vulnerable communities or communities that are already ris um, at risk of displacement and relocation, we ensure that we go as a team and so that we're able to do two things. One, engage the community together as a whole, but also separate the community so that we have people talking to young people, we have people talking to the men and people talking to the women, so that people, the, you know, the different communities can share really what's in their heart and what their burdens are without worrying that they will be judged by another section of the, of the community. And that's very important. And in your, your work and in your advocacy work, coming as a reverend and with the church, uh, what impact does it have uh, within uh, the Pacific and at the global level? Uh, it's easier to answer from a Pacific level. 70% um, of um, the Pacific population uh, members are affiliated to the member churches of the Pacific Conference of Churches. 90% of the region is Christian, so that makes it very easy for us to engage. And the church is embedded in the community. Um, in many places you won't find a health center or a school or a police station, but the church is there. And that makes the church front and center in the life of the community. In many communities, the weekly and daily calendar, the timetable for, for village life is based around time for prayer. And so it makes us in, in, in two spaces. One, that we can listen to what the community is saying, but two, we, in terms of our advocacy and engagement. And so at a regional level, we're able to work with, uh, with national leaders, regional leaders. We're able to work with political organizations and, and international organizations. And I think one of the things we're able to do is be, receive the messages from our communities and transmit that. And so we're very grateful to be able to work with, for example, the World Council of Churches or ACT Alliance, our colleagues here from Church of Sweden. That's why we're here. Um, and I think what's, what's really important is because we're, we're not only sharing the, the situation that our communities are facing, this rising sea levels, extreme weather, um, you know, sense of what is the future holding for our people, but also our role in providing hope for our people, providing counseling for our people. 
And it's our ability and the fact that we are present, just like your organization and your work with the communities that gives us the opportunity to advocate for our communities and come to the regional and global sphere and, and uh, gl global level and say, you've got to listen to us, listen to our people. Thanks. And Francesca, you're coming from an interfaith uh, organization, bringing different faiths together. Can the care for the creation unite? And how do you come together with different religions? It's a wonderful thing to, when you see people from different faiths start to talk about their love of nature, their desire to care for community and the environment, and then these common bonds are shared. In fact, it's, it can be quite peace building, um, you know, share, much better shared understanding. You can see actions taken in the community w because of the close bonds that are formed. And I think that's kind of an unintended consequence of the work, that we didn't re originally think of ourselves as trying to build peace, but the common understanding. And, you know, the way that SAFSI was formed was around a multi-faith approach. And I always think of the difference between interfaith and multi-faith. Interfaith is a dialogue between faiths. Multi-faith says we go together to deal with this issue. It's facing the issue together to get, you know, lined up together. So, and I think that's very powerful in terms of an approach. We also want to acknowledge the value of interfaith though, because that's often, as I said, an unintended consequence of really coming to understand each other, that we have the same very common golden, the golden rule, they call it, this common thread of caring for each other and caring for the whole of the earth community. And this is a very important and powerful message in all faiths whether they're an indigenous faith, a Christian faith, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, any faith you can think of, it's a common denominator. One of the, um, the things that we, we engage in, particularly at this time, and it's, it's not only in terms of our response, well, our response to climate change also is a response to globalization and colonization. And so we're facing not only the the impact of climate change, we're facing the impact of not enough finance to deal with climate change, and you spoke about that in the earlier session today, but also that the Pacific and other communities, and again, you mentioned this, um, the extractive industries for the new technologies that are, or new energy sources that are being explored, how do we continue to maintain care for creation? And indigenous knowledge, which is very strong in our region, uh, and is part of our culture, also interacts with the faith space, as, as you've shared. Um, I think also what it means is that we're able to engage at a, on a global level with 80% of the world who are people of faith. And I recall in, uh, in COP17, uh, which was my first climate uh, UNF C COP meeting in Bonn, and Henrik over there, roped us into some interfaith engagements with uh, Green Faith, and I found myself riding a rickshaw with two lovely ladies from the Brahma Kumaris in the back. You know, and of course, the sign of us working together is so important, and that we have a common message, but that we have the ability to mobilize 80% of the population of the planet uh, that's something that we really need to invest more energy into. And I think it's uh, for us as a quite a secular country, this is new food for thoughts uh, and important for, for us uh, to hear how faith and faith communities can be at the forefront. But coming back a little bit to, to the challenges within our communities, uh, the patriarchy, the men, uh, being at the leadership level very often. Um, but from a global perspective, youth and women are at the forefront uh, and activists for climate justice and climate change. Can you elaborate a little bit more these last minutes around how are you working on that? Well, I'm only here because I'm the, currently the general secretary. Um, if I wasn't, there would be someone else who does this job. And this is what we, we, we challenge. PCC has had female general secretaries in the past. 
and we try and find the appropriate person to speak at the appropriate level. Um, recently, we sent two young women to speak at the uh, Nuclear Prohibition Treaty meeting in Vienna, the Oceans Conference. And so, um, what we see, climate change shifts the dynamics around gender equality engagement. Some uh, within the patriarchal structures of church and, 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 and society, when we look at more clearer issues around gender-based violence, they are a little bit uh, afraid to engage. Um, you know, um, gender equality, they're also sort of a little bit to engage. But when we talk about climate change and the impact of climate change, because they can see the, the role that everyone has to play, um, and this is something that's very important. But at the same time, um, at the World Council of Churches Assembly, we heard from the young people, and this is important that we not only talk about gender, but youth, because the young people are saying, don't just put us in the front and encourage us, you have to accompany us as well. And so this is important that we start to have, as you said, that men also can speak on the issue of patriarchy, on the issue of, of the the intersectionality of climate change and how women are disproportionately affected. Uh, I come from a feminist family, so I understand the, the nuances of that. Uh, but I think it's important that we start uh, talking about this and encouraging male leaders to have that gender perspective or that feminist lens, at least with one of the two eyes that they have, to look at that. That's why we have two eyes, right? Yeah. Thank you. I give it to you now, the word. Yeah, um, it's so interesting because you, I oftentimes think, well, aren't we far along on this conversation already? But then I realize that's not the case at all. Um, you know, I was really touched by the, the film last night on Archbishop Desmond Tutu, but then this next generation coming up, they don't even know about this man, you know? And so sometimes I think we forget where we need to start from. And one of my staff members was leaving and she said to me, she, one of her things she said was, oh, you know, I can see women can be strong leaders, you know? And what does it mean to embody everything about being a human? Uh, the male and the female energies. Aren't we all allowed to embody all of those things? So it's a challenge to ourselves as well. We must challenge the church, we must challenge the faith communities to have real leadership. But also in leadership, how do we how do we take up that space and what does that look like? So it's something that I think about quite a lot. Um, yeah, so it's a topic that we must continue, but I think we're almost out of time. <laughs> we are, and, and thank you for being these leaders, uh, bringing this forward. And as we say at Act Church of Sweden, under the same sky, we all live under the same sky. Thank you so much. We continue the discussion. If people have questions, you come and meet Reverend James and Francesca. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.